News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukatali. And a very good evening to you and welcome to Newsline. And uh, News First continues the uh, Newsline series uh, via Zoom because of the concern that the COVID-19 is spreading. And uh, we too are doing what we can. Nevertheless, this evening, joining us by Zoom is um, the former, a former chairman of the Salon Tea Board, uh, Mr. Rohan Petiagoda. Very good evening to you, Mr. Petiagoda. Hi, Faraz. Hello there. And um, um, uh, in, the, in the ongoing quest for uh, something elusive called U.S. dollars, um, we want to talk to you about the, the, the tea exports and the tea industry. Um, is it quite as draconian as it sounds that if we don't use the, 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 um, the fertilizer that uh, we are used to using, and that if we go any other way, like organic fertilizer, that this will actually affect uh, our export of tea? Um, yes, I think there's a real risk of that. But I think you also need to frame this in the correct context, because the usual cost, the investment in fertilizer in uh, the modern agriculture, for example, in, in the tea industry, has been about 7 or 8% of the cost of or the, or the price you get for selling the tea. So it's a fairly small investment you make for an increment in crop of about 30%, which is why people spend money on fertilizer in modern agriculture. This has been the case for the last, what, 60 years. And this means that there's a lack of nutrient in our fields, whether it's paddy fields or tea fields, it's the same problem. So we're now having a need to introduce nutrients into these lands. Now, people call this organic agriculture, but I don't think that's valid in the context of adding fertilizer because organic fertilizer is a kind of oxymoron if you think about it because the whole idea of organic is that the soil replenishes itself and you use composting and other methods to have it sustainable organic agriculture doesn't mean that you import your nutrients from china or anywhere else so i think this has all got a bit mixed up the thing is we are stuck with the decision the government has taken the government doesn't want to backtrack on that they've got their reasons for that I think it's mainly a loss of face that's causing this. But now we've got a nutrient crisis in agriculture as a whole in Sri Lanka, and that's what needs to be addressed. Now, in order to address this need by importing so-called organic fertilizers, you run the risk of making things worse by bringing in fertilizers that have got issues because organic fertilizers come from different sources, for example, from animal waste or sewage sludge, um, which is fine. You can make fairly good, clean fertilizer from these sources, but you have to be very careful about your quality standards or you can introduce a pathogen like salmonella or shiga toxin from E. coli or something like that, which will make things worse. And people can die and have died from, from consuming these toxins. You can, you can make your organic fertilizer from plant materials from other agriculture in China, for example, um, from compost. But you run the risk then that these composts might introduce to Sri Lanka kinds of fungi, for example, that commonly occur in compost, which you don't have here, which could harm our agriculture, could also bring seeds of those plants that the compost is made from and introduce alien species into Sri Lanka, which is also a risk. But I think from what I've seen on the media, the compost that is now being uh, intended for import to Sri Lanka is made from marine algae. Uh, this marine algae is a consequence of mainly the aquaculture industry because they use huge amounts of nutrients in uh, close to the shoreline of, of the sea in China and surface China. Many other countries, Argentina, New Zealand, um, have, have had problems with uh, these algal blooms. And the most common uh, alg alga is called a sea lettuce, funnily enough. It's not an edible lettuce, but it's a, it's a beautiful green weed, but it's a noxious weed. Uh, 
<laughs> the problem with the sea lettuce is that it absorbs all the toxins that are in seawater very effectively. It's a great water purifier, but at the same time, it contains all these toxins. So in making the compost, you've got to be very careful to get those toxins out before you ship it over to Sri Lanka. Otherwise, you might be shipping a load of stuff that's really bad for us. For example, cadmium, lead, uh, copper, and so on uh, could be in those composts. And then when those get absorbed, for example, by our tea, and we export the tea to other countries, you could have problems with heavy metals in our tea and get our tea uh, banned from import into the EU, for example, who've got very high standards on this, or in Japan. So there's a lot of risk. I'm not saying it can't be done. It can be done. But managing this risk is a huge new challenge and something that the agriculture sector in Sri Lanka hasn't been adapted to do. Uh, and this, this would take several years of adaptation, I think. And um, the, this uh, removal process of the unwanted items from the this organic um, from this uh, organic imported fer fertilizer what sort of time period is is there to to remove these unwanted items I, I think you're looking at months it's it's not too bad but you have to make sure that you get those uh, heavy metals for example down to acceptable levels You've got to get moisture down to an acceptable level. There's a lot of salt in these marine algae, which you have to get rid of, or you're putting a lot of salt in land, like tea cultivations, which are not adapted to uh, dealing with a lot of salt. So you, you can cause new problems, because it's not like we've conducted experiments in this country to deal with these fertilizers. Normally, before a new cultivar is rolled out into production, for example, the Tea Research Institute does decades of experimenting before we start a new uh, pesticide being used in Sri Lanka, for example, they'd test three to five years in various fields that pluck the tea, that have the tea analyzed and make sure that it's safe. Now we're trying to do this all in the space of a few months. So it's fraught with risk. At a time when nobody in this country is working efficiently because of COVID, whether it's the government or the private sector. So we're at, at the worst possible time, we're trying to do the impossible. And usually that fails. And um... <clears throat> Uh, how, uh, as a former chairman of the Salon Tea Board, uh, how conscious are buyers of tea when the production process uh, changes, like, you know, when we change the fertilizer? How conscious is the end user? The end users in most developed countries are very conscious. So if you're looking at Japan, Australia, the EU uh, and the United States, um, they would test our tea quite carefully for problems. And, and, the, the, and they do this. This is an ongoing thing. We, we test agriculture produce that comes into Sri Lanka. This is, this is done by plant quarantine. Every country has its own import regulations. So this is not unusual. And it's, it's not also casting an aspersion on the quality of Ceylon tea. It's just that we are trying to do something very difficult, not just on the fertilizer front, but on this so-called transition to organic agriculture, because you've got other problems there as well for us. Because, for example, to if you're going to grow 100% organic paddy, for example, you take a loss in production of, what, 30% because you're not using modern agricultural methods. So you have to make up for the 30% loss in production by getting a price increment of, what, 50% to all or at least 30% to make up for that. Now, how do you get that? You have to get your rice or your tea certified as organic. And you've got to get consumers to buy that produce, whether it's tea or rice. Now, to get it certified as organic, each organic farmer has to get an organic certification from one of seven organic certifying agencies that operate in Sri Lanka. These are all foreign agencies. Six of them are European, one's uh, Australian. And each farmer has to pay $300 for his first registration and usually about $200 a year after that. Now, $200 is 40,000 rupees. That's about a month's income for a farmer who has to forego this. And these are poor people, a million rice farmers, 400,000 tea farmers, and not even counting vegetables, coconut, oil palm, and rubber, and all that. Here. So you have a massive compliance problem. Now, the Sri Lanka Standards Institute has put out a standard, uh, the SLS uh, 1324, I think it is. And that's 85 pages of fine print that every farmer now has to follow, in addition to paying 
sixty thousand rupees for year one and forty thousand rupees thereafter per year in order to keep his certification alive. If one former def farmer defaults and adds some pollutant into his crop, like a uh, illegal pesticide or something, the whole industry now is is affected by that. So it's a massive risk it's a business risk that you're taking because your whole production chain has been put into one quality brand now and that's a very uncertain quality brand and sri lanka produces 300 million kilos of tea a year now there's whether there's a market in the world for 300 million kilos of organic tea is an open question altogether it's difficult enough to sell our tea as it is and it's not like sri lanka can't produce enough organic tea at the best of times there's many organic tea producers in sri lanka it's not like it's not like they've got not enough produced to supply the, the, the demand for these things is, is a small fraction of the global market i can't see for example our major buyers in in russia iran iraq syria egypt uh, turkey and so on rushing out to buy organic tea they're not going to pay that 30 percent premium they what they want most of all is consistency of quality and character in our tea and that's what we've had a, a century long history of providing now, suddenly you turn that around and your market might just walk away from you. Um, the uh, uh, Sri Lanka has a, uh, um, a sort of long history um, littered with several precedents of uh, doing things almost on an ad hoc basis. Um, and the lack of planning and so on has uh, resulted in many, many a uh, uh, thing that the media points out. But um, surely when it comes to tea, uh, hasn't the, as far as you know, uh, Ron Petiagoda, uh, hasn't the industry sought some form of a um, exemption for this uh, industry? It is our flagship export product, uh, after all. Are you aware of any sort of uh, move to seek an exemption? I'm, I'm sure elements of the industry have made this appeal. But I don't want to dwell on the management of the tea industry for us because the tea board has a long tradition from the time of Mr. Ratwate, Dr. Ratwate, our first chairman in the 70s, of uh, former chairman not criticizing the established uh, or the current administration. So I'm going to uphold that tradition because I think it's a good one. Uh, so I'm not going to criticize or, or talk about the industry as it now stands except to say that the policy of the government as a whole has put the industry in a very dangerous place. And I, I, I worry about that. And, and to go back to your point, yes, we've seen these policies, sudden policy shifts that have happened from time to time with no warning whatsoever. In 2001, uh, President Kumaratunga uh, announced overnight that she was banning the import of GM produce, genetically modified produce. And if you think about it, 100% of American soya and corn, for example, are from GM produce. They've been doing this for the past 30 years, and no one is blowing in the dark as, as a result of this. It's perfectly safe. But she banned it. And then, like, there was an outcry because it had such a dramatic effect on agriculture. And then she slowly backtracked. Without There was no public uh, announcement of backtracking, but eventually, slowly, the customs are told you can let it in again. In 2015, President Sirisena did pretty much the same thing. He banned glyphosate and other herbicides. And then that was totally backtracked as well, because a few years later, they found that the tea industry was collapsing on them. So they now allow glyphosate to come in. At least you can buy it. I don't know whether it's legal or not, but it's, it's available freely in Sri Lanka now. So again, that's been backtracked on. So we've got this idea of capricious policymaking in, in Sri Lanka, because I think when politicians don't take advice from the institutions that are set up to give them advice, you have failures. And this is a good example. So a decision like shifting the country to organic would best have been done by first having rounds of consultation with the farmers, with the agriculture department, and so on. And, and also with people like the Export Development Board to find out, do we have markets for these products that we're trying to sell now? And then to have a gradual shift. In fact, if you look at President Rajapaksa's 
uh, manifesto from 2019, that's exactly what he says, that we will have a gradual transition. But then the transition happened very suddenly, I think because it was precipitated by the foreign currency shortage. But I think if the government honestly told the people and the farmers, look, we've got a foreign currency problem, we can't import fertilizer anymore, not in the way we could before. So we are going to have a, a very high price on fertilizer, get used to it, suck it up. I think people would have been more sensitive and more receptive uh, to an explanation like that than saying that we're going to go to organic because as night follows day, this organic rule is going to be reversed in the next year or um, at most three years because you're going to have a, an agricultural collapse on your hands to deal with otherwise. And uh, on that note, um, we are in conversation with uh, Mr. Rohan Petyagoda, of course. Uh, we'll take a short break in which time we can have a quick peek at this evening's headlines from the News First primetime news team. We'll see you on the other side of the break. News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukot Ali. Who was at the emergency meeting held at the former president's residence? Government representatives oppose the government. Who is responsible for the data wipe at the NMRA? Minister of Public Security with no authority. The police sergeant who risked his life to stop a drug racket. News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukot Ali. And welcome back to Newsline Zoom. I'm in conversation with Rohan Petiagoda, a former chairman of the Ceylon Tea Board. We are all concerned about the export of tea and uh, the incoming U.S. dollars, because obviously there is a crisis in the foreign exchange uh, availability. So let's ask uh, uh, the, uh, Mr. Petiagoda, what is the risk then, uh, Mr. Petiagoda, uh, of uh, going organic? Well, let's let's before you look at the risk for us, perhaps what we should look at is what are the benefits. Because obviously we did this because we wanted some benefits. Now I think there's a perception in the, amongst the public and a perception that I've tried to dispel that somehow modern agriculture carries with it many risks and people are concerned by this. Everything modern, when there's some modernity in life, we worry about the risks, whether it's modern transport like Aeroplanes, people are frightened to fly. We are frightened to get injections when we when they save our lives even. And like that, modern agriculture has got a bad rap because, of course, multinationals are so involved in modern agriculture. Agriculture is a very big field. So you've got companies that are very rich making money off agriculture, whether it's producing uh, pesticides or fertilizers or seed material or technology for accelerating growth of plants and so on. So this is a difficult thing for the public to absorb. Now, at the same time in Sri Lanka, we've had people going around saying that our cancer rates are going up and so on, which is not true. Our cancer rates have been coming down or staying very static, and, and they're certainly much lower than the rest of the world. So we're doing good on the cancer front. All the WHO and health ministry statistics bear this out. I've made a podcast about that uh, separately. But the there, there is this perception that, for example, kidney disease in the northeast uh, of Sri Lanka is associated with agrochemicals. No evidence whatsoever, but if someone points a finger at that and says that, then people tend to believe it. When you think how easily people believed all the panic stories about COVID and started taking various completely untried and tested um, medicaments um, and how quickly those failed, you get a, a feeling for how difficult it is to deal with the public when the public is concerned genuinely about a problem like their personal health. So I think the president's approach to this was very, very brave. He he felt and he had made this statement uncontroversial, uh, uncontroversially in his manifesto in 2019 that Sri Lanka will shift to organic. And no one sort of said, hang on a minute, you're talking nonsense. And remember, he was backed 
in the Vyatmaga movement, for example, by the leaders of the tea industry. And none of them said, hang on a minute, you've got some problem in your manifesto here. You know, so they need to take responsibility now because many of the biggest players in the tea industry today were supporters of Mr. Rajapaksa when he was running for president. So I don't pin this blame completely on him. He did what he thought was the right thing in, in a way that was uh, endorsed by the people who surrounded him, many of whom, whom were from this very uh, sector of the economy. Now, having done that, having done precisely what he promised to do, people are now criticizing him and saying, hang on a minute, you shouldn't have done it at all, or you shouldn't have done it so quickly. In my view, he shouldn't have done it at all, because no country in the world has tried to transition its, its agriculture into organic. It, it was only tried in Bhutan, they abandoned it very quickly, or they postponed it, which is another way of saying they forgot about it. Sri Lanka will probably do the same thing a year or two down the road. Um, but people with any experience in, in agriculture know that this can't be done. And that's what we failed to do, that the tea industry, which is largely made of tea traders, people who buy and sell, who don't really think deeply about the sociology of tea, for example, don't really give much attention to what goes on uh, in the agricultural part of the industry, which is the really tough part, the, the 400,000 smallholders who grow the tea, the 18 regional plantation companies who grow the tea and put it to the auction and get it exported. So I think it was a miscommunication. Now we are stuck with it and we've got deeply entrenched views one way or the other. So we are at a high risk of forcing through a policy which is unworkable. We have to pretend that it's going to work because otherwise why would we do it in the first place? And then it carries its own risks. Now, what are those risks? I, if you look at the risks from organic fertilizer imports alone, and this is a topical matter, I, I went into the problem of problem of heavy metals, for example, from fertilizer made from seaweed. The risk from importing fertilizer made from sewage sludge, for example, or animal uh, waste, because that carries its own bacteriological risks. The risks from importing uh, organic fertilizer made from agricultural waste from farming, for example, from plant waste, and that carries its own microbiological risks and, and so on. Um, I should remind you that just 10 years ago, a, a bacterium from a organic farm in Germany killed 53, 53 people, hospitalized 6,700, and gave 800 people chronic kidney disease for life. Now, just imagine if such a thing happened from conventional farming, from modern agriculture. There would be an international outcry. There would be outrage. There would be protests. But... When, it, when the organic industry fails, no one really wants to protest because the organic industry is meant to be clean. But in my view, the organic industry is anything but clean. It is a new colonialism which is being imposed on countries like Sri Lanka by the West. Who approves our organic food as being organic and fit for consumption in the West? It is the West's organic multinationals who do it. This is another, people use this word mafia a lot, but I, I think it's a strong word, but it's, it's another consortium of interests, which in business is the norm. You know, it's, it's nothing new. So we run huge risks at, at various levels, at the agricultural level, at the marketing level. And we tend to forget the actual constituents who's, who are the stakeholders of, our, of this industry, the farmers. In tea and rice alone, 1.4 million farmers who actually grow this stuff and no one's really listened to them and what they need. And that's why I think it's a massive risk. It's a sociological risk. And I, I worry that we'll have an insurrection from the farmers if we don't give an ear to their concerns at a time like this, because these people are poor. They're, most of them live at the edge of poverty and they really can't take much more stress in their, in their lives and their livelihoods. So we have, we have huge risks on every front and the economic, the social, the social uh, agricultural, uh, fronts. And I haven't seen any serious attempt by anyone in, in the institutions of government paying attention to these concerns. Uh, um, uh, talking about the, the, the plight, you know, the economy of uh, those involved in the production, um, already um, uh, workers in the plantation sector are lucky if they're getting about three days um, of work every, uh, every week. 
So in that context, it appears to me that the, the plantations uh, are not replanting and perhaps our, our trees are not uh, giving the desired um, output. And also strikes me that for, uh, for the last few years, uh, the, um, uh, the tea industry have been almost happy with the 300 million kilos that they are supplying and it appears to me again that it, uh, it appears to have reached a uh, miraculous plateau, a 300 kilo plateau. Um, why aren't they investing in replanting and so on? Why, what's the problem? Well, part of the problem of replanting is that it's a very slow process. When you, if you replant today, you have about 20 years in which to recover the investment you're making in, in that replanting process. It's about four or five years of unproductivity before that replanted uh, tea plant starts producing useful tea in the first place. So it's an extremely slow process. And you must remember that, for example, these, these farmers can't afford to just slow down their production for replanting because how are they going to live? They need that produce to live from. So they're stuck in one vicious circle there. And then you have, on the other side, the regional plantation companies who are operating on leases of a few decades. So if, you, if your replanting takes a few decades to start paying back, why would any company start replanting? Because they, they may as well harvest until the tree is dead rather than replant. It's, it's like you're living in a rented house and then spending millions on, on doing it up and you know that at the end of your lease, you've got to give it back. So this business model that we started as a, as a result of the disastrous way in which we nationalized our, our tea plantations in the 1970s, is, this is the consequence of, of that. So rather than putting the plantations into the hands of the people, on, I think land reform was very necessary in Sri Lanka. We didn't want foreigners owning all the land and we didn't want a few Sri Lankans owning huge amounts of land. But land reform didn't succeed because rather than putting the land in the hands of the people, the government grabbed it all and the government can't manage it. And now it's been badly managed as a result of that. So this, this was Mrs. Bandaranaika's policy failure. And since we're talking about leaders, let's, let's take them one at a time. And then you have the other problem, which is the social problem. When the tea plantations were started in the 19th century, we had a very paternalistic colonial society. It was all right to indenture labor, very poor people from South India, keep them in these so-called lines in very bad conditions and have them as resident laborers. Now, the idea of resident laborer, even as a domestic uh, aid or servant, has gone out of fashion. People want to live in their own homes. They want to commute to a job and have some self-respect in life. No child of a tea plantation worker or even a smallholder wants to do what his parents did. They want to leave that because we've given them free education for a reason. There's no point in spending on education on, on, on children if all they're going to do is pluck tea leaves. So we want to invest in the future of our children to go into the new economy of the future. And that means we are equipping them with degrees, with A-levels, with vocational qualifications, not to pluck tea. And the return they get from plucking tea is too small to make it worth their while because young people nowadays at the lowest end want to work in a supermarket, they want to work in a gas filling station, they want to work in a, in a, in a checkout counter, do something more dignified with their lives than, than agriculture because agriculture hasn't ever <coughs> earned dignity in our society. So I think the tea industry is doomed to fail, but I don't see that as a bad thing, because if you look at other countries who've developed rapidly, who had tea industries like Taiwan and Japan, South Korea, for example, their tea industry shrank in volume, but went up hugely in terms of quality. And so I think Sri Lanka is headed in the same direction, that we, our tea will, will shrink in terms of the numbers of kilos exported. I don't think that's really important. But in terms of the value we are adding, we'll probably keep going up quite a lot. So that, that's something that I don't see as a big uh, On that note, uh, um, uh, Ron Petiagoda, we're going to have to, we've run out of time, actually. Um, so thank you very much uh, for your uh, expert opinion on this. And uh, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, wait and see, shall we? Um, thank you very much, indeed, for your time on Newsline Zoom. And that's the way it was on Newsline Zoom this evening. Uh, do take care. Have a great evening ahead of you. And as always, God bless you.